In this video, we continue with chapter three on energy. This section is about energy harvesting and how is that energy stored, relocated and utilized. This slide presents us with a number of profound implications of energy harvesting. As panel A shows, energy in food could be released in one step. However, most of that energy would then be wasted as heat into the environment and it may be strong enough to even destroy or disable the cell in some capacity. So nature has come up with solutions as indicated in panels B and C. Food molecules are dismantled in discrete steps and during those steps other pathways extract energy as the energy is liberated from the food molecules. In this example the pinwheel takes energy from the falling rock and converts that to stored energy in the form of the bucket. And the energy that's stored in the bucket's potential is then utilized later by the cell to drive other hydraulic machines or biochemical pathways. The bucket represented in this figure is really a form of energy carrier. Energy carriers are special molecules adapted by nature to transfer energy from one location to another, from one chemical reaction to another, or across cells for various purposes. There are four very important energy carrier molecules that we need to learn about in this section. These molecules are adapted for carrying energy in the form of electrons or protons of hydrogen or functional groups like phosphates and methyl groups. In my analogies, I will refer to rechargeable batteries and taxicabs as analogous structures that can be easily related to in terms of energy transfer. In most cases, the principle illustrated by this slide applies. On the left hand side, we have energy stored within food molecules. Now, most food molecules such as glucose do contain quite a large proportion of energy that has been stored there by plants and other organisms by a transfer from the sun. So these molecules are then broken down through biochemical pathways, liberating energy. And in the process, that energy is then sequestered by our carrier molecules. In this diagram, they use the symbol of a truck to indicate something that is transported from one location to another. In the process of food transferring most of its energy to energy carriers, the food becomes oxidized in the form of carbon dioxide and water. And that process, as you now are familiar with, is known as catabolism, or the breakdown of large structures into smaller structures. The energy is then delivered either in the vicinity or across membranes to other organelles and other structures within the cell. That energy is then used to drive the combination of simple molecules or the rearrangement of other molecules into new chemistry whereby the energy is then stored within the bonds holding that chemistry in place. Building of larger molecules from smaller molecules is referred to as anabolism in biochemistry. So this general figure here will apply to all the energy carriers in the way that they function. Let's begin our understanding by studying the behavior of ATP. ATP is a very ancient molecule used by all living organisms to harvest energy from biochemical pathways. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine refers to this base combined with this sugar. And the T stands for tri, which means there are three phosphates within the molecule all bonded together. The bonds between the oxygen and the phosphates, at least these two here, is very high energy. 
that means the electrons are carrying a lot of energy which can be released once these bonds are broken into the environment. Now ATP can be hydrolyzed, that is broken down, to ADP and that stands for diphosphate because the third phosphate has been broken off by the hydrolysis reaction and in the process energy is released into the environment. Now this lone phosphate is referred to as inorganic phosphate or PI. So if you see PI in the text, they're referring to free-floating phosphates in the environment. Now, the energy that's liberated is taking place right here. So this energy is released into the environment and it drives other chemical reactions. So once ATP is broken down to ADP, the energy has been liberated. In order for the ADP to be resynthesized back into ATP, we would then need to supply energy from the food molecules, or in the case of plants and bacteria, in the form of energy from sunlight, to force the PI back onto the diphosphate, restoring the triphosphate condition. This process repeats many, many times in the history of this molecule, and the analogy to a rechargeable battery is now obvious. The battery charged at the top is discharged at the bottom and then recharged and discharged multiple times. Students should try to learn the structure of ATP and ADP. In other reactions, the same molecule, ATP, is used to transfer the terminal phosphate, this one here, onto other molecules in a hydrolysis reaction. So the gray molecule could represent anything within the cell, which has the potential to acquire the phosphate group from ATP. At the bottom, you can see that after the reaction is concluded, the phosphate group, the PI that we had in the previous slide, has not been released into the environment, but instead has been bonded covalently to the other molecule, the gray molecule. And in the process, this PO bond this covalent bond between the phosphate and the oxygen is now referred to as a phosphoester bond, phosphoester. Anything to do with oxygen is an ester, and the other atom is a phosphate, so this is a phosphoester bond. So the energy from ATP has been largely transferred to the gray molecule. The gray molecule now has a higher energy content than it did before it acquired the phosphate group. This figure reminds us that chemical reactions, as observed by us in the formation of an AB product, actually take place through substeps. The substeps are necessary in order to guide the chemistry in the proper direction. So in the presence of an enzyme, as we learned in the previous video, the substrate B is first attacked by the ATP on the surface of the enzyme and the hydrogen atom is pulled off and the ATP donates a phosphate which connects to the oxygen. So this is your phosphoester bond right there. So this makes B a very energetically charged molecule. So much so that it looks for and reacts with A very quickly and in the process liberates the phosphate group as a PI, also a molecule of water. The result is that A and B are now covalently linked to each other and that bond between the two is the result of the energy initially contained in the triphosphate. This related slide shows exactly the same but with another named chemical reaction. So glutamic acid is converted to glutamine through a two-step chemical process on the surface of an enzyme. Because glutamine has a higher energy state than glutamic acid, ATP is used to supply the energy. The first step in this chemical reaction is the transfer of the phosphate group to the glutamic acid, as you can see at the top here. So this again is a phosphoester bond. 
uh, immediately this molecule is formed, it contains enough energy to seek and find an ammonia molecule on the surface of the enzyme and immediately transfer the nitrogen and two hydrogens to its structure. And once again, in the process, ADP and inorganic phosphate are released into the environment as well as a molecule of water. Two other very important energy carriers are NAD and NADP. The mode of operation of both these molecules is the same as we discovered with ATP. There are two very important differences between NAD and its cousin NADP. The one difference between NAD and NADP is the presence or absence of a single atom. In the case of NAD, we do not have this phosphate at the bottom terminal sugar. But in the case of NADP, this phosphate does exist. And as you can imagine, the presence of chemistry can change significantly the shape of a molecule, affecting how that molecule interacts with other chemistry in its vicinity. Regardless, the rest of the molecule is exactly the same for both NAD and NADP. So let's take NADP as our example in this slide. So once again, the molecule, the energy carrier, alternates between two states. The energy poor state, i.e. the uncharged state, and the energy rich state, which is carrying energy in the form of electrons and protons. Just like ATP, it gathers energy from energy liberating reactions and transfers some of that energy to other reactions which require energy. In the process, it discharges itself and it recycles multiple times in its history. The location at which the electrons and protons are carried by the molecule is to do with the nictinamide ring, this ring at the top of the molecule. And as you can see here, the hydrogen connects to the carbon atom at the top of the ring, and the electrons are dispersed throughout that conjugated ring structure. So that's where the energy is carried at the top part of the molecule. So going back to what we learned with oxidation reduction, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So when the molecule loses its energy in the form of protons and electrons, it is said to be oxidized. And when it gains electrons and protons from other food molecules, it is said to be reduced. So returning back to our analogy of a taxi cab, we could say that the oxidized form of NADP is the empty taxi cab without passengers. And once it picks up passengers in the form of electrons, two electrons and one proton, we can then say that the taxi cab has passengers and is full. So it alternates between carrying passengers, the reduced form, and the empty taxi cab, the oxidized form. A good example of how NADP works is given by the generation of cholesterol from its precursor. In the process, electrons and protons are required to rearrange the chemistry within the seven dehydrocholesterol molecule, forming the cholesterol molecule in the process. There are a couple of other molecules that we need to talk about in this chapter. One of them is FAD and the second one is acetyl-CoA. But before we do, it's important that you note that there are a number of other very important molecules involved in transfer of energy by various chemical structures. Here we see the structure of coenzyme A an important energy transfer molecule located within the respiration cycle of the cell. An interesting correlation is that the molecule itself is also based on a nucleotide. And at the far end of the molecule, where the acetyl group is located, the sulfur and the carbon at the end of the molecule are bonded together by a high-energy covalent bond. 
The concluding part of this chapter simply talks about how enzymes can be depicted graphically as aiding a chemical reaction. So the panel A on the left hand side shows in this particular example that the reactants have a higher energy level than the product. So during this chemical reaction, energy should be liberated into the environment. And as we now know, that should be called an exogonic reaction, exogonic. However, the reactants to be converted to X, they have to overcome a energy barrier. And that energy barrier is called the activation energy. Only some molecules under normal thermal conditions may have the necessary energy to restructure their chemistry and overcome the energy barrier. But for many, many reactants, uh, they may not have such capacity. What an enzyme does, it lowers the activation energy, the energy barrier. Therefore, more and more reactants are able to achieve the necessary reconfiguration to overcome the repulsion between electrons and nuclei to re establish their chemical structure to then convert themselves into the product X. So enzymes basically permit more chemistry to achieve the necessary reconfiguration to become a product. Another quick way to analyze that is that in the absence of an enzyme, very few molecules have the necessary energy to convert themselves into products. In the presence of an enzyme, the number of molecules that have such an energy is increased simply by the enzyme permitting more molecules to achieve their activation energy. Textbooks offer alternative ways of depicting the same chemical thermodynamics. So in this example here, the authors have chosen a levy to indicate that not all the waves have the right energy to overcome the height of the levy. In the presence of an enzyme, the levy is reduced and more and more of the waves have the necessary height to overcome the barrier. In this example, same thing is illustrated, that the water is unable to leave the container because not enough of the waves have the necessary energy to spill over. However, in the presence of an enzyme, you can see that not only does it lower the activation energy, an important second principle is that it only allows the chemical reaction to proceed down one pathway of all possible pathways. So in this example here, we have four possible pathways in which the waves could proceed down, but only one of them has been lowered, number one, by the enzyme. Therefore, directing the outcome of the chemical reaction rather than being random. And that last principle is once again reinforced by this slide, which shows you that as the chemical reactions proceed, the enzymes at various steps, so there'll be an enzyme at each one of these steps in yellow, the enzyme permits only one pathway to be chosen from a multitude of possible pathways therefore encouraging the cell to only generate the chemistry that it needs. And then finally, a summary slide just talks about the active site on the enzyme, and we'll talk more about these in chapter four about protein structure. But as you can see, different enzymes can catalyze uh, reactions in multiple steps, as we discussed in a previous slide.